this morning on the Ag Issues program. A pleasure, as always, to bring on to the program Roger McCohen, Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, as he joins us on the program this morning. Roger, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Greg. Good to be with you. Well, let's get to it. We've got uh, three topics here we want to discuss. The first one that uh, we uh, that everyone has heard about and talked about concerns uh, the federal court in Arizona, and they vacated the registrations of three dicamba products, uh, Extendamax, Ingenia, and Tavium. But then, of course, on Valentine's Day last week, uh, we had the decision by the EPA as well concerning what farmers can use. Uh, through some of the orders that they had. So run run us through this as to uh, the timeline on everything and and, uh, where we stand right now. Well, I'll do that, but let me give you some of the background and give the listeners some of the background behind dicamba. Of course, it's been around since the 1960s to target broadleaf plants, and in recent years, it's been used to combat weeds that have grown resistant to glyphosate, including pigweed. Um, now, the current problem stemmed from a change in the usage of it that started really after 2016, because before that date, dicamba was primarily used as a pre-emergent that was applied to the ground in late winter or early spring before you planted crops. Uh, it is no, it is a chemical that is known for being highly volatile, meaning it's going to evaporate into the air and travel off target. And that's the reason why dicamba was historically used only as a pre-emergent. But it was in late 2016 that the EPA issued its first ever registration that allowed the use of dicamba directly onto crops for the 2017 and 2018 growing season. And that they granted a registration then to new uh, what were low volatility forms of dicamba that weren't intended to be used on soybean and cotton seeds that were genetically modified to be resistant to dicamba. So that decision, Greg, to approve over-the-top use of dicamba, uh, when it initially was made, was very controversial, and it quickly was challenged in court. And the plaintiffs at that point in time filed a lawsuit against the EPA claiming that their registration decision violated both the federal pesticide law known as the uh, FIFRA, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act, as well as the Endangered Species Act. Now, while that lawsuit uh, challenging the 2016 registration only was dismissed by the court after the registration expired. The uh, plaintiffs refiled their case to challenge the 2018 registrations, which EPA had all had approved in the meantime, uh, or had issued in the meantime, I should say, to reapprove over the top use for another two years. That's the case that they won, uh, and that involved the three dicamba-based products that you mentioned: Extendamax, Ingenia, and, and well. Uh, that time it was uh, Faxapan. And the decision was issued in June of 2020, leaving a lot of farmers with uh, uncertainty kind of in the middle of the growing season, not unlike what we're dealing with now. So that was the Ninth Circuit decision. <clears throat> now, after that decision, EPA issued a notice of cancellation to formally cancel the 2018 dicamba registration. But it was months later that they issued a new registration that reapproved over the top use for the 2021 through 25 growing seasons. That's the one that's at issue right now. And that new registration included additional use restrictions that EPA thought would resolve the issues that the Ninth Circuit had found were problematic with the 2018 registration. Uh, And it was the same plaintiffs that challenged the 2016 and the 2018 registration that sued to challenge the 2020 registration. Now, they raised the same claims in their lawsuit as they had in the previous two challenge uh, challenges to that, but it was their arguments made against the 2020 registration decision that ultimately swayed the Arizona Federal District Court a couple of weeks ago. Now, the problem here is that EPA has not been going through the required mandatory administrative process to get approval uh, for these re- re-registrations. They are skipping the mandatory notice and comment procedures laid out in the Administrative Procedures Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the uh, FIFRA law. Uh, and that's what the court said. They said, you cannot do that. Uh, that's, uh, that's a violation of those notice and comment procedures. You have to open this up for public comments. You have to have a hearing. You have to give notice of that. Uh, and so by issuing the decision without a public comment period, 
the court said it's pretty easy here. They violated the established law when you issue a new pesticide and uh, un- for un- basically uncanceling a pesticide that had not been formally canceled. So uh, EPA under FIFRA has to publish in the Federal Register a notice of each application for registration of any pesticide if it has a new active ingredient or it would entail a changed use pattern. And that's what the court focused on. And you got to give 30 days notice for that. And you cannot skip that process. So the court invalidated those uh, registrations for, in this time, Extendamax, Ingenia, and Tavium. Uh, and, and as you said, on Valentine's Day, uh, the EPA issued an order allowing existing stocks of those three products to be applied directly on the crops so long as the pesticides were labeled, packaged, and released for shipment before the court's decision. So the court's, or excuse me, the EPA's order will allow those products purchased before February 6th, the date of the Arizona court's decision to be used this growing season. So that relieves some of the pressure that was on producers uh, right after the court opinion came out. And the order, if you, if people look at it, also provides instructions for how to dispose of unwanted or unused dicamba products. This had been a huge issue, Greg. I got flooded with emails and telephone calls, particularly from producers down in Texas that were ready to plant cotton. I had one individual that sent me an email. Uh, now, this one called me. He called me and said, uh, Roger, I have purchased uh, almost a half a million dollars worth of these products, uh, or excuse me, the, the cotton seed that uh, I'm going to use the Dicamba products on. And, uh, of course, you do that for tax purposes. He's prepaying and deducting those costs. And he said, we're about ready to roll with planters here in South Texas. Uh, What do I do? And uh, my comment to him was, well, if history repeats itself, we may get an order for uh, the use of existing stocks. You you clearly purchased those before February 6th. And uh, uh, thankfully, that's what the EPA did. But um, this has been a mess ever since the USDA uh, has started to approve these products for over-the-top use. It's been an absolute disaster. So where does, uh, plainly put, what does the future for the over-the-top dicamba, how clear is it or unclear is it in in probably some cases? Yeah, well, it's unclear. Uh, Of course, the EPA could appeal the court's decision, but who are they going to appeal it to? The Ninth Circuit the court that already ruled against them on the 2020, uh, in the 2020 case, uh, which vacated a similar registration. Now, alternatively, they could seek, the EPA could seek to re-register over the top use of dicamba and follow the law's requirements for for providing public notice and comment uh, for that registration. Uh, It baffles me why or how you have this happening when the law is clear in terms of the registration process. Go through the notice and comment procedures, set it up for a hearing, follow the rules. You won't have these procedural problems. It's not a problem with the procedural aspects of the law or the courts acting out of turn. The courts are following what the law says on this. It's the EPA that hasn't been following those procedures set forth in administrative law. It just baffles me how this how that can happen, but it has. In essence, what the oh, well, I, lack of a better term, that uh, EPA's feet are to the fire, so to speak. They are. And this whole process all the way through, just slow down, follow the administrative process. If you want to do this, you've got a product that is highly volatile. And uh, when you're dealing with a change use pattern, that is what the law requires in this instance to have public notice and comment and just follow those procedures. And I think EPA would be okay. But for some reason, they want to jump that process and and it's caused these problems each time. Now, fortunately, EPA has come back and said farmers can use existing stocks uh, prior to the to the court decision in each instance. That has been very helpful, uh, but it still creates a lot of uncertainty moving forward as to the use of these products. Roger McCohen, professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, is our guest on the program this morning. Roger, let's go over to a proposed new tax legislation Uh, This took place at the end of January in the U.S. House, and that it uh, passed the U.S. House 
uh, currently in the U.S. Senate, but break down the details of what we're seeing in this new tax legislation. Well, we have several things in there that I think are important to farmers and ranchers and other provisions uh, more generally applicable to people. One has to do with the employee retention credit, which has been an absolute uh, mess, uh, to, to put it bluntly, uh, with all types of fraud and promoters uh, preying on people uh, on this. And that's really what this bill does. The, the This bill tries to crack down on the promoters of the ERC by putting in some additional penalties, extending the statute of limitations for IRS to audit uh, ERC claims, uh, takes that to from five years to six years involving that and uh, substantially increases the penalties on promoters. So that, that's a good one. Now, uh, to put that in perspective, while the entire tax, this entire tax bill is scored at about $78 billion of, of, what, of what it would cost taxpayers, just uh, changing uh, the deadline for filing employee retention credit claims to January 31 of this year from April 15 of next year, they said would save $77.1 billion in spending. That's how massive this thing is. So, so just moving that deadline up and cutting this thing off and ending it, uh, ending the handouts here would be a, a major, major way to pay for this bill. It also changes the t- child tax credit, uh, increases that to the refundable amount on the credit to $1,800. It's a $2,000 credit. So the refundable portion would go to $1,800 for last year up from $1,600 and then uh, adjust that for inflation in, in coming years. It'd be $1,900 next year, $2,025 plus inflation inflation adjustments on the um, uh, income uh, income portion eligible for that. Uh, for the next three tax, well, actually 23, 24, and 25, they changed the way it is computed uh, to make it more lucrative for people uh, that have qualifying children. Also, research and expenditure costs would change the current amortization provision on that to current deductibility, uh, and that would stay deductible uh, through 2025 would change it from 2022 to 2025 on business interest. Now, this is where we start to get into what would be really more relevant to a lot of the ag producers on the business interest. Uh, they're computing. And of course, what we're dealing with there is a limitation on business income uh, for certain uh, very high end, uh, high revenue, high gross receipts businesses with an exception out for certain uh, agricultural operations. They're changing the computation of one of the qualifications for that uh, known as the adjusted taxable income. And they would go back to the pre-TCJA rule of that. So all people need to know, they can read my article for more details on this, uh, is it really makes it m- more likely that you can deduct business interest if you are have very high gross receipts uh, and uh, uh, you can take advantage of that provision. That's all I'll say on that one. It's really complex. On bonus depreciation and expense method depreciation, first on bonus, that went to, under TCJA, we started the phase down last year from 100% first-year bonus depreciation to 80%, and it would be 60% this year. What this bill does is change the 80 from last year to 100% and keep it at 100% um, in the out years on that, so, so through 2025. So, uh, the and, and that's, again, that's a retroactive uh, increase of bonus uh, for 23, 24, and 25 to 100%. Now, that, that's going to cause numerous issues because many farm assets qualify for bonus depreciation. You have to be 20-year maker's property or less, so that's your farm buildings category or less. So you, all your machinery, equipment, uh, of course, your tractors and so forth are in there. They're going to qualify for that uh, and you know, workhorses, those types of things. And that's that's an important change because uh, people that have been disqualified from claiming expense method depreciation because they have been limited out by that can use bonus uh, on some of those same assets. And that's uh, particularly true because the personal property trade rules under TCJA can cause large machinery purchases that get you over that 179 threshold to utilize bonus. So that, that's a really important one. Now, it's a headache for practitioners. Because if this, if Senate passes this and we get a rule change on this and some of these other provisions for 2023, then you have to go back and amend returns. And it, it, that, that just opens up another can of worms. Plus, IRS has to change forms. Tax software companies have to change the tax prep software and all of that. 
On the 179 expensing, what that is is a slight increase in the maximum deductible amount and your phase out amount for uh, 2024. Uh, it, it just increases that a bit. So that, that's kind of nice, uh, and we can use those. Um, there are other provisions in the bill. It's pretty detailed with some other stuff. Those are the major provisions that apply to farmers and ranchers. So right now, uh, well, obviously it passed the House, so it is in the Senate. Does it have enough support to pass? Oh, I think it will. It overwhelmingly passed the House, and uh, I, I, I'm seeing things in the Senate indicating that leadership wants to pass this. The thing is, with the Senate, with their rules and with their calendar, it's going to be a slow slog to get it there. It's not going to occur before March 1, which is the date by which many farmers file their returns, which creates a hassle. Uh, so, you know, yes, I think they'll get it done not before March 1, probably before April 15, which then again is going to cause issues with IRS. IRS is going to have to change forms because of the retroactive provisions in the bill, and the tax software companies are going to have to change their software. It creates headaches for practitioners that then go ha- have to go back and amend returns. And, of course, farmers have made decisions with respect to depreciation uh, based on the existing 23 law and will likely have already filed returns before this gets passed. All that would have to be changed uh, to take advantage of, for example, a higher depreciation provision uh, with bonus in in particular. So it's a headache when Congress does this. Uh, this is why I recommend to farmers that you might want to pay a little bit of estimated tax uh, to bump yourself off the March 1 deadline so that you can file by April 15 without having to pay a penalty. So uh, we'll see what happens, but uh, a lot of good stuff in there. I just wish they wouldn't do these things on a retroactive basis. Roger, one more thing we want to get in because it's very important uh, case uh, that is in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, but it has big stakes for agriculture and it's looking at taxing wealth. Yeah, Greg, this is a huge one that the this currently before the U.S. Supreme Court. They'll decide at this term. They've already had oral arguments on this uh, back about six to eight weeks, well, six weeks ago. And this is a case that comes, uh, it, it involves a company in India that makes small agricultural tools for farmers. And it is what we call a, uh, a CFC, a, a, a company that is more than 50% controlled by people in the United States. So the shareholders are United States citizens uh, predominantly. And TCJA had a, law, had a provision in that law that said basically on a one-time basis, uh, it's not called this, but I'll call it this for simplicity purposes, we're going to repatriate uh, some of the tax uh, in those types of companies, these, these commonly controlled foreign corporations. And uh, what that said was, if your investment in that company goes up, we're going to get hit you with a one-time tax. And this goes all the way back to 1986. So it's got, <laughs> it's got all types of issues with it legally, I think. And uh, what they said was, uh, the, the taxpayers in this case, your investment in the company went up uh, to a certain extent that triggered a $15,000 tax. So they got a tax bill that's from the Treasury in the mail. And they said, now, wait a minute, where's this come from? We didn't sell our stock. We didn't do anything. There's no taxable event. We didn't dispose of our stock. We didn't transfer it. We didn't trigger any tax. And this is what the 2017 law says that the government can do. So they're challenging that. And it's a fascinating case uh, before the Supreme Court. And if they say that this is permissible, then this gets us to what Senator Elizabeth Warren has wanted to do, Bernie Sanders has wanted to do, the current administration uh, would be in on this. And that is when somebody dies, for example, uh, instead of waiting for the heirs to sell the property to make that a taxable event, uh, we would impose a tax at the point of death on the appreciation in the value uh, while that decedent owned that property and not wait until the heirs get it, basically wiping out uh, to a great extent uh, what we know as step-up basis, which is absolutely critical for just about every farming operation out there when you're looking to transfer assets upon death, say, to the next generation. So it's a, it's a wealth transfer tax without a taxable event, and we'll have to see how the Supreme Court rules on this. All right, Roger, if uh, people want more information 
or want to read further, uh, obviously they can find this on your blog. Yep, they can, uh, as as well as over on Ag Manager site for uh, the Ag Econ Department at K-State. All right, sounds good. Roger, as always, I very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. That is Roger McCohen, Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, as he joins us this morning on the Ag Issues Program here on 580 WIBW.